Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and we are live with Vlog. There's a 234 Windows 365. Everyone's excited, you know, Windows as a service, desktop as a service, because that's a solution that'll solve all our problems, right? <laughs> I seen that and uh, I brought it up. I don't usually cover that topic on my channel, but it's obviously something that we really do. So I'll be bringing it up a little bit, but it's nothing. It's not that exciting, folks. Sorry. Um, Microsoft's actually offered this through their Azure platform previously. So this is a slight variation on a more or less current offering. I don't know. I think it's another way to get attention to it, but I don't think desktop as a service is the most amazing solution to the Windows problem. And it's not a cheap one. So it's not for everyone. It's for people that can spend that kind of money on it and things like that. So that's my, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. So live here, we got people checking in. Uh, Hey, the UK people know a good Microsoft 365 reseller. You know, I, that question comes up and I, I don't know the answer at all, but feel free for those of you that do know. Um, the um, the challenges get confusing when you have all these different resellers and partners in it. I really dislike most of the partner program stuff. It's messy. I don't know why Microsoft just isn't. I guess they just don't have the, well, don't want to dedicate. I can't say don't have the resources. Don't want to dedicate just handling it themselves. Doing things through the third parties that are out there for the resellers is just messy, um, confusing. And of course, Microsoft doesn't make it easy to resell their stuff. And that's just, yeah. The Azure virtual desktop, for example. And let me find my tweet. We'll actually start. I should have probably pulled it up beforehand, but hey, if it wasn't for the last minute, nothing to get done. Um, we'll pull up the Nerdio site. They have they had a good write up on it. But one of the things right away about the way it's sold, and I'll I, I tweeted this out. I'll drop a link in there as well. I guess we can start talking about this. The uh, share screen. Whoops. Share. There we go. Click on the wrong button. Chrome tab. Windows 365, Azure Virtual Desktop, ABD, comparing the two desktop as a service products. They did a really nice technical breakdown of how all this works and how all this ties together. And I think that's pretty cool. Like Nerdio, if you're not familiar with them, they're kind of a go between. And I used to not completely understand why Nerdio existed. And then after working with the uh, Microsoft products, you understand completely why Nerdio exists and <laughs> companies like them. And I, I don't use them, but just they're a go-between, so to speak. They are a way to make it easier to resell desktop as a service with the whole Microsoft platform. But what's crazy to me is just how long this write-up is because it's so nuance and so many details and what works, what doesn't work. It's not an easy product. And then to go on top of that, to go on top of that and the fact that Microsoft will probably change it a few times and tweak it, you need a team on top of it just to figure out how to sell it and how it changes and why your bill didn't match because there's a new feature or a uh, feature they removed or just a different way they handle it. It's just I, I don't think we're ready for um, desktop as a service for the most part. I, I see people pitching it, but I also see the big downside. The expense of it is one of the problems because you, for what you spend on desktop as a service, you can buy a new desktop every year. And that's one of the big challenges with it is it's not cheap. So you, if you can keep buying a desktop at the same rate, then why would I put it? Oh, the convenience of the cloud. That is for a niche customer, not bad, but yes, it's one of those things. Uh, I'm jumping through the CSP, which is the uh, customer reseller program system. Uh, CSP now, not a fan. I should just be able to easily get set up and sell and take over existing tenants. Oh, if it was only that easy. it It's just everything. And yeah, I hate having to work through a partner just to get a Windows Server a SQL license. Just take my money and give me my key. Yes, this is how more companies should work with direct such a pain in the butt um, trying to get it through these people because they also want to spend time on the phone upselling you. And I'm like, stop upselling me. I just want to get a thing because I'm trying to accomplish something. So yeah, 
Um, I'm not sure where you get the $59.99 a month. Nerdio had actually commented that desktop as a service is going to start start at $32 a month. Um, but of course, by the time you add in things like Office 365 and everything else, I don't know. It, it's kicking the ball down the road a little bit. Here's the reality of it. And I've commented numerous times on my channel about this topic. All new applications being built that are line of business applications. Let's give a little bit of a qualifier for it. Um, when you're using and you're looking at way companies are uh, building out new line of business applications or making web-based applications where they don't run as a desktop service. The reality is the reason you want desktop as a service is because you have some legacy Windows applications you want to run. And because Windows is notoriously Windows for all the uh, shortcomings it can have when there's updates and problems, uh, desktop as a service can make sense in those, whether you're delivering you know, the application services or that. But it's always based on the way we legacy have always done things versus the new way things are being done uh, where everything is web-based. And it's, it's all those things like eventually we're going to not have to need the same level of applications. More things are just going to be web-based. Uh, this is one of the reasons the browsers are such a popular attack surface because all the extra functionality and where people are going with these apps have made them a richer target for threat actors. But to the same extent, it actually makes in some ways a little bit easier to secure because of the way you secure it. And running a bunch of desktop applications is just yeah, what could go wrong running a bunch of untrusted applications? Oh, you want to try and sign them and get them trusted because that'll fix it until it doesn't and all the other issues we've had. So, <laughs> but yeah, little by little, it'll, I don't think we're going to get there anytime soon. The fact that Microsoft's rolling this out and it takes this much of an explainer in Microsoft's explainer is, I think, more confusing. But yeah, that's uh, what we're we going to do. Slowly, we'll get there. One day, we'll have just a better ecosystem for tech. It's uh, this is the evolution of things. The the tale of legacy is long, and uh, yes, um, can't agree more about the desktop search versus local machine. Most businesses just don't need it yet. Uh, niche customer for sure. Useful if you don't already have the jump boxes RDS. Yes, uh, and it creates a dual threat layer because one of the pitches I'd seen by another company was that they were offering some of the security with their desktop as a service. But you still have to also offer a layer of security on the device that's connecting to it so it doesn't get compromised. So now we have two different devices. I got to make sure I have the one locked down in the cloud and then the device they're using to access the one in the cloud because yes, that's a popular target to um, go after the device that they're getting to that. So it's not an it's not like you've just completely solved the threat problem. You've actually kind of changed it. And then the other, some of the nuances that broke down over NetNerdio is, uh, let me actually pull it back up so I can find it on there. I don't think you get, uh, I believe it's, let me find it real quick. I read through this this morning. Because you don't get to choose exactly where, uh, this means routing security and VPN and IP addressing cannot be controlled by the customer. So this is some of the nuance you have to, be upsold again on getting more granular control on how like the firewalling and egressing works. So that makes it that much more confusing. Again, if you're trying to do threat intelligence where you want to look at the firewall, look at the ins and outs and how a threat happened and things like that. And what IP address are coming from when you're spinning up in the cloud, you don't natively get that, but I believe it's part of a different tier where you do get to have more control. It was a lot. So it's yes, this, I don't know. I don't think we're there. And uh, someone says, does it run in a browser? I think you're asking about the new stuff. I think that's some of the access goals Microsoft has to be able to, sort of, you know, connect using a browser, so to speak. Um, I don't know what Windows dependencies it'll have. I didn't dig that far into how they're deploying it. So nonetheless, I don't think we're really, we're not there. <laughs> It's at least I'm not there. I'm not saying it's the end all solution to things. And matter of fact, I think, did I screenshot this? I was, uh, do I have it? Cause I was mad. Not mad does not, mad is not the right word. Um, so I'm, I'm going to read it cause I don't want to call the vendor out, but this is the top line item on a, it wasn't nerdy. I'll just say that on another vendor pushing managed, uh, desktops. Learn how to sell your virtual workspace managed clouds to increase your revenue. 
with clients. Their pitch isn't about how it solves a problem. Their pitch is how it will increase revenue with your clients. And I'm like, that's important. I'm in business to make money. Don't get me wrong. But when product companies come at me and their first pitch is how it makes money, not how it solves a problem or will enhance security or does a service for my clients. I always like, why is that the lead all the time? Is it, you know, I want to understand how it solves a problem. Cool that I can make money with it. And that's going to be, I, I care that I can make money with it. Like I said, I'm in business to make money. I'm a for-profit company. So yes, that is a factor, but it's like the lead many of these companies have is how to increase your revenues by selling our stuff. But does your stuff solve problems? Well, no, that's besides the point. You'll be able to increase revenues with it. And that's the problem we plan to solve. You need more money. You would like to extract more money from your clients. Use our product because it's a it's a product that helps extract money from their pockets. That's like the sales pitch for the first 20 minutes. And you're like, I, I want to know how it solves a problem. <laughs> so, ah. Uh... How is that different than AWS Workspace that has been around for years? Um, how it's different is Microsoft makes money selling licenses to AWS Workspace who sells the compute time and Microsoft's able to you know, fund their own licensing differently, but no, it's really not. I don't think it's that much different. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, Win 365 runs from a web browser, RDP client, iOS, um, Android, soon to be Linux, at least according to today's MS Inspire sessions. Yes, I had heard that too. Um, I I heard it from a few other people that watched those sessions, so that I I will I will give that as a very very plausible to be true. Um, I have not fact checked you, William, but it makes sense to me. <laughs> uh, It solves the problem of your client having too much money. That's actually a great sales pitch. Does your client have too much money? We have this wealth extraction tool we'd like to sell you. <laughs> uh, we get a cut of it. You get a cut of it. The client, they get our solution. But what does your solution do? Oh, that's beside, it extracts money from the client. What do you mean, what does it do? What do you, it doesn't have to actually do something, does it? Yeah, some companies don't have, at least from my perspective, the best sales pitch goes back to the same with these partner portals and programs that we were ranting about. They're just not how they could be, not how they should be. But there are other topics in here because we can't get Kaseya out of the news, can we? And uh, I think we'll start with my Twitter for that one. Because uh, uh, I'm kind of aggravated with the statement people have been making that I will have some qualifiers for as soon as I pull up my tweet and then follow up with the click. So, uh, share screen. And that's this right here. So here's where, um, we pay more for licenses than hardware. Yeah, that's true too. I, I will I, I will say that's um, becoming a real thing for the most part. Softwares, I stay out of the hardware market as much as possible um, because hardware is a race to zero margin all the time. And we try to avoid it because I just don't care enough to try to resell hardware and things like that. It's just, I, we don't mind if the customer, we make more money ourselves, just like how there's more money in licensing, the labor exceeds the hardware. The labor is where we make money is selling and leveraging the knowledge we have to provide a solution for clients. That's where my margin is, um, not in trying to make a markup on something that someone else, basically what I say race to zero margin, unless you are the one manufacturing the hardware is someone calls you and wants a PC of this spec. And then they want the same, you know, Dell or Lenovo PC from someone else. And now it's just a matter of who's going to cut their throat the most to make this sale. And I don't care. I'm like, buy it direct guys. Just go on Amazon and get it. Whatever. Here's the model number. Go get it from Amazon. And uh, we'll do all the labor to set up. The labor to set up is more margin than I'll make selling 10 computers. And it's just, that's where that's where the market's gone to. This right here, though, and uh, this trusted sec, I, according, even Kyle from Hunter Stabs, I think he tweeted, hey, kind of quick that you guys dumped this, but we're here now. We're here now. And uh, this is the problem I have when people keep saying it can happen to anyone. And now I'm very empathetic to the situation that the MSPs are in. I'm not throwing them under the bus. 
I am empathetic in some ways to Kaseya. Like, hey, it sucks this happened to you guys because it's not just the CEO. It is a, a lot of people that were damaged by this. But it can happen to anyone is true. If you are being attacked by a sophisticated threat actor, I'm sorry, it is very hard to survive against a you know, sophisticated attacker. The problem is the code is so broken in the Kaseya system that it's not a sophisticated attack at all. It's an opportunistic one that I can't believe didn't happen sooner. Someone just didn't look around for it. And this goes to the point of one, Kaseya's had more than one security incident. This is not their first time dealing with, you know, their tools being used against them. But the code in question here but this code is so broken, it did not take a sophisticated attacker, just an opportunistic one to exploit this flaw. This is that flaw. Else login, okay. I almost wanted to call the vlog that, but I, I thought it'd be, it wouldn't be as like to the point. It's kind of nuanced, but else login, okay. Um, the two last statements were the interesting thing happens in case of password equals row password, the login will fail. However, in the case that all checks failed, it would default to an else clause that sets login okay to true because no password was provided to request the password variable would be null and login okay would end up being true when login okay is set to true. The application sends the login session cookie will eventually and will eventually, if no other parameters are provided, like what the attackers did, end up in an if clause and returns a 302 redirect to the user portal. They failed open on this by sending null passwords. You can't tell me your company went through code reviews by any competent pen tester. And I see it. I'm just saying, like, if I, I'm not an expert on this, I'm not a secure code writer, but I think fail opens bad. And I think, think this is bad based on analysis by people who are much smarter than me at coding that this is bad and that it's one of the and i you know i this is uh malware attack and he's obviously got some attention here um by posting it and you know that was with it which actually it's funny because i i like the uh malware tech and uh swift on security i know you got that reaction image from me and you're welcome <laughs> so it just uh and that there, that is definitely uh, my feelings on it too, right there. So, yeah, the it's really aggravating. So I will go back to the statement of the fact that yes, this can happen to anyone, but you should be doing at least some of the basics, some of the pen testing, some of the application testing should have been done by these people. And seeing things like that makes me think it was not done. It was not done thoroughly. It was not done by that. And these companies are also not doing a good job of being public about this. This is one of the problems. And I, in a, another forum, um, I had a private discussion about this and uh, let me pull it up because this is very relevant. I'm going to pull these links up and switch over to another browser. We so open it up everything here. Um, I, I didn't know if I should do a video on this particular topic, but either way, um, I still might. One more link to open up. And it's this company here. There we go. So share. That one right there. Keybase is not softer than tofu. Now, I know Keybase got bought by Zoom, so they're not, you know, they're still existing and they're still updating their stuff. But yeah, um, it's it's an issue. And um, they did a whole security audit and write-up and transparency. And this is one of those things that is really important that they do security and pen testing. But how do you know they did it? Well, in their case, they actually did the entire breakdown, uh, listed all the things they did, how things were done, broke. I mean, this is pure levels of transparency on your code. Then let's talk about zero tier. Here's their assessment and summary for how their security was implemented. And I've talked a lot about zero tier. 
This is how they do, you know, they paid an outside company to assess step-by-step through their code, how it went. And then they made the results from that company. So this is not zero tier tooting your own horn. This is what a security audit looks like from uh, apparently a company called Trail of Bits. But that's what's important. You want to not only do this, but have it done. And let's go really far to, I think this is like the real standard for it because they've already gone through a couple of them. And I think they did a great job of transparency. Here's Bitwarden breaking down all the facets, SOC 2, SOC 3, 2020, 2018, risk auditing, breakdowns of everything else, full link to the report. Here's our report that we're dumping out for you. This is something that these companies could do, but they would actually have to do the security test and then publish the results. I don't think they're doing that. They're saying we do QA testing. I want to see this level of transparency in your system. And I think you'd be substantially better. Uh, you, you would put us so much further ahead in confidence. Um, so it's, I'm hoping, and it'll be one of those domino effects. Once the first company does this, great. I think a lot of more of them will have to do it because it'll be like the gold standard in the market that you have this done, that you have levels of, you know, companies going, Hey, I don't want a company that hasn't gone through this level of transparency and pen testing. And this is what we want to do. So it's, it's definitely a um, long time coming in the marketplace. And it's kind of what we need in order to better trust the tools that we have, because it's, hard enough to set up all the stack and tools refer to beginning of video where we ranted about buying things through resellers. It's even worse when those tools that we spent all this time configuring and set up and all the pain we went through talking to salespeople are then used against us because they weren't done. And it's a disservice to all the people that spent time selling you the product because their jobs are in jeopardy because the product will shrink to some of the user base, probably still survive as a company and come out the other side better audited now, but that's now after the damage is done and a big mess was made. So hopefully the market will get better for all of this. That's uh, me being wishful thinking. <laughs> That's Tom's rant on all of that. Oh, where was the, there we go. Put this, put the chat back. So what other questions there? Uh, what is your liability? Better have a policy. You definitely have liability there. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, talk to your lawyer, talk to your insurance policy holder about your liability on it. You are likely to be part of the tiered lawsuits that will probably loss a business to everything else. There's a lot of legal stuff that's going to happen. Uh, but yes, you can point the finger at the other person, but you're, you at some level, depending on how they do it, you're on the hook. So yes, you have some liability in that. Ah, do do do. Yeah, from a supportive uh, view, someone and someone who works in reselling, uh, advising my stuff, manage file transfer, having this level of transparency would be great from our vendors. Yes, absolutely. It would be so good if they had um, that. That's just, and I'll assume that's the uh, question you wanted answered was the legal liability. You know, I did break down and I think I have, uh, let me find it real quick. Legal. Uh, I thought I did a video on this topic with Kaseya. Let's see. Uh, can't find it. I There's a write-up somewhere, and that's the problem sometimes. Lawrence system, if I put blog on it, will I find it? Uh, I could say a... Uh, act legal. How's that? Let's see if I can find that. No, nope, I'm not seeing it. We do this because they have learned systems. Oh, I should spell Kaseya right. <laughs> I'm looking at make sure I figure, figure everything else out. There we go. That's the July 2021.
There's so many of these. Man, I got a lot of search results here. <laughs> uh, let's see. <laughs> Can say I had ransomware that avoided devices with Russian keyboard layout. Yes, that's true. Um, it's not that the Kaseya, it's not specifically the Kaseya, it's the fact that they were using Soda no Kibi. That particular ransomware avoids Russian key layouts. So um, that's where that comes in to play. Uh, I believe, and we can probably pull this up too, if you're interested, and this is a fun topic that, um, let me see, is it, what's the one? GRC, uh, Steve Gibson just covered this over at Security Now, and I thought it was a good, good write-up. Security Now, I'll find the link. Um, 826, I think it's going to be, was it? what's his last show number? Is it 828? 827. I think that one. And to <clears throat> he's got a chart. There we go. He's got a chart in here, and I'm going to share this. So this is a solid write up for sure. Share screen. So this is a breakdown. This is from uh, Security Now, episode number 827. He does an absolute wonderful breakdown of just how well written this ransomware is. And one of the things Steve points out is there are no steps in here that are extra or unused. Like This is a very complex ransomware. It is it's shockingly well went, written, exempted extensions, exempted files, how it works, how it does all the keys, how it creates separate keys for every server uh, that it does. Um, it even talks about, because it's malware as a service, how the campaign keys work, as in, yes, they have a customer service. So you have the R Evil ransomware group, then you have the affiliates, and how they create all set of keys for all of them. So it is... Uh, it is wild how good they are at this. They they have they understand the products they're attacking and the systems they're attacking at a higher level than many of the people defending or even the people that are using these products. So uh, this stuff is very, very uh, in-depth. So there's a, but it's a great breakdown. It's in his show notes or you can listen to the podcast, but uh, Steve Gibson hats off to the guy for having some of the really great detailed show notes. So if you're just into reading, you don't even have to listen to the podcast. You can just read through it all and be able to do things. Um, what is also kind of crazy to me, um, this right here, they're using uh, 25, 5, 19. Like they're using modern elliptic curve cryptography, like really solid stuff here. And uh, if you're not familiar, I, if uh, maybe I was quoting it, someone can correct me on this. Um, the Celsa 20 symmetric cipher, I believe that's even the same one that's currently used in WireGuard. So actually I'll look it up. I can fact check myself on this. So uh, WireGuard Celsa 20. Yes, that is the same. Uh, it, the reason it's used by WireGuard, it's a fast cipher. It's a modern cipher. It's quite good. So um, they're using the latest and greatest in cipher technology to do this. This is not for, um, this was not written by amateurs. These are people who properly implemented. This is also why when people say, well, can't we just decode the files? No, please note that these are not easy to decode because this was so well written. And it's not that I'm, showing any respect for these people, but it's to understand that you're not dealing with an average threat actor here. You're dealing with a really top level threat actor to be able to um, do this. So yeah, they, they aren't using just your average software. This is some of the, you know, the threats people are up against with this. So this is kind of my rant on those things of we need better security audits because this is what we're up against. And while we're also up against, while, while we have the Ransomware operators using the latest and elliptic curve encryption. We have Kaseya, else if fail open, login okay. I mean, <laughs> you can see that the um, 
it's it's an asymmetrical warfare. <laughs> this is you may have a nice symmetric cipher, but the the warfare is asymmetrical. It was it was bound to fall to uh, people that can write really good code and people that can go, huh? <laughs> so I don't know. Like I said, I'm not trying to just pick on because they they're not they're they're the latest, but they're not the only. There's plenty of other bad code hanging out there. Uh, especially in the enterprise market because it just hasn't gone through rigorous testing. And it, it's just a matter of uh, time before we see more and more enterprise software cracked. I think Dell was in the news for one of their uh, enterprise offerings being cracked the other day. It's, it's going to be an ongoing problem. It's going to take a long time for the enterprise software to really get the scrutiny it needs and get caught up until it, it's not a problem. So, uh, yes. It's, uh, you know, philosophy on finding bad guys don't backdoor or outlaw cryptography because you can't build a better mousetrap. A lot of it comes down to security and layers, disaster planning. There's not there's not a key that unlocks, that, that fixes this. There's not a one-step one good mousetrap because, you know, I, I still started the conversation and I, I'm curious, you know, what did or didn't stand up. But then that fell apart because uh, one of the things we tried to figure out is why. And this is information that was posted in some discussions over on Reddit, our MSP. You can follow in there. And there was a lot of discussion that went back and forth about what did or didn't withstand the attack. And honestly, um, from some of the people that were involved in the incident response, they're like, we've seen... X product fail in one scenario and go uh, and stop it in the next, but we don't know what the difference was. We can't play it back, so to speak, because it was the same ransomware attack, but one stood up to it, one didn't. But honestly, if you have everything in layers, it's just part of the stack. So as it kind of, if you pictured it as a marble being dropped down, where's it going to hit? Which layers is going to stop it? Well, if you have a whole series of them, you're better off than, yes, uh, than just the, singular uh, one, hope, hopefully one defense works type attitude. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, yes, this is um, the Trojan, pro uh, I can't remember the name of the project, but yes, the, this was that phone. This was an interesting, I, I, I hope there's some good debriefing on it and some uh, post analysis. And what happens is, and this is why I like Darknet Diaries is they cover things. Jack Recyder covers things in depth, but he also does, as he he's, he said, historical news, not news news. But the way you get to historical news is from the time of an incident versus the legal proceedings. The legal proceedings, just, you know, all the lawyers are going to go back and forth. There's going to be a lot of discovery. There's going to be a lot of digging into information. Then they're going to be able to compile all that. Once that happens, then you have court transcripts to paint a picture of what really happened in a, you know, timeline sense and everything else. When you're always looking from the outside, we know that the FBI had a sting operation. We know components of it, but once things go to trial, we'll have like a nice timeline to be able to build the picture of exactly what happened. So I think it's going to be kind of a fun one. Uh, there's yeah. The FBI, um, Anon. So yes. Ah, the North, yeah, the North Korea one. Yeah, there was a there's a couple odd ones they had in there, but they offer a lot of uh, a lot of insight. So, <laughs> uh, can the unified security gateway be used with PFSense? I think it's a terrible idea. I would not you 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 can double NAT things. I just don't know why you would. I can't come up with a good reason to do it. It creates more headache. So it's not that it's impossible to do. It's just not a good idea to do. So I don't, don't use them both. <laughs> um, what else was there? I I'm going to give it 10 more minutes because I have an event to go to. So what else do we got for me? Throw, throw your questions. We can go off on tangents now. I see someone say, why would you want to stack firewalls? Um, yeah, don't stack. I mean, there's don't stack firewalls. How's that? Um, oh, my picture is of some really hot, hot sauce. So that's, uh, 
where we go here. So I did have some Joluca mustard hot sauce. So that's definitely. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, any idea why PF Sense VM seemingly blocks all Google services and sites? Uh, you probably loaded PF Blocker and blocked all the Google stuff. But that would be my assumption as to what happened. So. <laughs> Uh, SG-1100. Is the SG-1100 still good for an office about 20? Uh, well, PFSense is not a good web content filtering platform, so it may work. I think it's a little underpowered for um, an office, but it'll work. It's, you're not going to get the most speed of it. it. We usually, the minimum we install in most offices is going to be like a 3100. Uh, 1100 is just a little bit weak. Unify Talk, I'm not using it anytime soon. I'm assuming you're talking about the phone application they're using. I There's nothing about it that I think is great. I missed the Win, Win 365. I talked about it a little bit in the beginning. Uh, I, there's a link to the, and I tweeted out for that Nerdio has a really good write up on how it works. Uh, so there's that on my Twitter. Uh, minimums. I sell clients to 3,100. That's kind of for us too. We stock, we don't always stock them, but, uh, because they go pretty fast. We try to at least keep one or two on hand. Uh, one in case anything goes wrong for a client, we have one at the ready because we've sold so many of them. But yeah, I think 3100 is a solid solution for small business. Uh, now, this is a good question. When does the Unify coffee maker come out? What is the next market Unify will pivot into? And uh, I don't know, That that's an interesting question. Will they dump it again? Yeah, I don't know. Yes, the 6100 is delayed. Apparently, there was a volcano eruption. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. Uh, they tweeted out a Twitter poll of, what do you guys think caused it, a volcano eruption or supply chain? Supply chain. I, supply chain is what it is. So that's um, it's a problem. It's a problem for sure. Yeah, look at the 3100. It's it's we we like them. They're just a good, solid, reliable, works every time, supports uh, reasonably fast internet. And in case they ever need VPN, it's on there. Yes, I seen the uh, Jira ticket update. So awesome. That's uh, the, the True NAS has finally fixed the CPU panel bug. I don't even look at the CPU panel that much, but it still makes me happy they fixed it. I mean, it shouldn't have been broken, but hey, that happens. Hey, thank you, Biker Chris, for the donation. Much appreciated. Still got four more minutes. I can uh, share screen, Chrome. Uh, that's That stuff here is crazy so uh if you guys are looking for something to happen it was uh Jal jaluka uh which is like the ghost pepper mustard i can't believe how hot that is i was uh shocked so <laughs> i don't think doh uh doh to allow pf blocker if you're using doh you're not going to get pf blocker because you're bypassing a local dns so yeah, that's not there. Uh, the hot sauce came because of this. Um, me and my son went and had uh, tons of hot sauce. I think I got 
we went to it's called jungle gyms in cincinnati and just crazy amounts of hot sauce we bought lots of things you can there's just this whole area this is all rows and rows of hot sauce so we um yeah <laughs> So much sauce. Ah. What else was I? Uh, do, do, do. I've been debating about this. I went. Um, I don't know if it belongs on my tech channel or just as a separate thing. But a couple people did ask me about doing a uh, review on my Tesla, like, you know, a ownership review older. I took it up to the Smoky Mountains and took it for a drive. So now that I've had it for a few years and like 36 or 37,000 miles or so on it. Um, I don't know if it fits my channel anymore though. It's like, do I do one? It, I get, got a lot of views last time I did it, but there's a lot of people doing test reviews. Or do I put it on my personal channel? I haven't really decided. The problem is I don't have any subscribers on my personal channel. So nothing gets traction on there. And you know, if the goal of making a video is to get people to view it, then you kind of want people to view it. So, but yeah, nonetheless, uh, it is a piece of technology. So I guess it's somewhat related. That's what I did over the weekend. So, <laughs> uh, nothing's really broke, but yeah, I mean, it's like any car that's in the 60 K range prices on repairs are a little, can be a little bit high, but there's a lot less to go wrong. So how do you manage to find pl charging places on long trips? Um, where's it at? I took pictures uh, everywhere. You don't look for them because unless you have an electric car, it's not something you look for, but the superchargers, you just stop. <clears throat> takes like 20, 30 minutes to charge on a supercharger and uh, away you go. You're, you're charged up and uh, ready to go again. So yeah, they do have, they have a lot of superchargers um, everywhere. Matter of fact, uh, if you go to Tesla road trip, if you type in like Tesla road trip, they have a site that'll do all the planning for you. The car does the planning as well. So yeah, Kyle uh, here at the office had the mustard too. It was, it's not death levels. It's enjoyable. We, me and him were eating um, ghost pepper pepperonis uh, covered in that hot mustard. It was a great combination, but solid, solid for sure. I'd eat more of it. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, and that's responding. Yes, it was definitely the hot sauce and the thumbnail was both good and hot. That's that's always the, the combination we're going for because extracts are hot but not good, or like the bomb, which is frequently used in the you know, the hot ones episodes. It's just bad. It's hot and it's not good at all. So, <laughs> uh, the new Ubiquity ten gig switch. I didn't know they released a new one. I have. I have their 25 gig switch and I have several of their uh, 10 gig switches, but yeah. Uh, nonetheless, thank you all for joining. Smash the like button before you leave. That'd be wonderful. i am got to get going to the next thing that I have to go do today. So wonderful having all of you here. Uh, leave comments down below or head over to the forums. Uh, we're, matter of fact, because we have our new unpaid worker bot, uh, Kyle set up to automatically go through and post these videos. It makes it easier if you want to comment on the video instead of here in uh, YouTube land with their crappy comment system, you can comment over in the forums on this video. Uh, but if you know, let me know your thoughts too. And some of what I ranted about, about the security auditing, you know, what do you think the solutions are? I think all of us need to come together as in not the vendors because the vendors have been the failure. Um, you know, what would hold their feet to the fire? Is it more transparency? I think that's the solution, but I could be wrong. Um, I don't know. I'm just uh, just one of the many tool users out there hoping the tools don't be get used against us again because uh, that creates a lot of disaster and ruins a lot of things. And that's not what we're looking for. We want to see the bar of security raised, not uh, not exploited because else log in OK. <laughs> All right. And thanks, guys. See you next Thursday and sometime in between. I'll post some videos. <laughs>